Hey everybody, obviously I'm not with you in the flesh today, but I'm thinking about you, I promise. Uh, Lynn and I are down uh, catching a show that the kids are in uh, at college at SoCal, and we'll be back uh, for next weekend. Uh, we'll actually be back uh, later on uh, today, Sunday, uh, and uh, with the kids uh, for spring break, so that's cool. Hey, at the beginning of the service, uh, Dar made you stand up and uh, answer this question. What Winter Olympic event do you enjoy the most? We'll be coming back to that later, but I'm wondering what it is for you. There's a lot of really cool events out there. Uh, so just curious which one uh, captured your fancy uh, the most. This week in the series of uh, uh, Experiencing the Heart of Christianity, which is a 12-week series, we're in week 8, uh, based on Marcus Borg's book, uh, The Heart of Christianity. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. Uh, last week, <laughs> uh, kind of pushed the envelope a little bit with you, perhaps, uh, and I hope you're, you survived that okay, but I also hope it made you think and ponder and reflect and pray, and even if you're mad at me, that's cool, as long as, uh, as, long as you're doing the dance with God and working that stuff out, I think, I think we're in good shape. Today's uh, topic, though, has to do with a concept called thin places. Thin places. Uh, thin places uh, are related to opening the heart. Uh, thin places actually uh, is a very, very old term. It goes back many centuries, uh, all the way back uh, to what we would call the UK and Scottish mysticism. They're the ones who first started to speak of this thin places thing. So we'll explore that uh, in just a few minutes. But this one has to do with the heart and understanding the heart in itself. And Borg gives us uh, this understanding of it, that the heart is an image for the self at a deep level, deeper than our perception, intellect, emotion, and volition. As the spiritual center of the total self, it affects all of these, our sight, thought, feelings, and will. Now, you know, we get this. This is a biblical term. It shows up throughout the Bible, both in the Old and New Testaments, this idea of the heart. And we use this too. This isn't, this, this isn't really that, well, it is ancient, but it's also contemporary, meaning this idea of the heart as uh, expressive of the total person or the core person is something we can easily relate to. So in Olympic sports, um, if you've watched dancing, uh, like uh, ice dancing, uh, for instance, um, they will, the commentators will talk about, well, they did a great job, uh, but their heart just didn't seem to be in it. And what they're talking about is there was, there was just a special something that wasn't quite there. If it's their passion or the way they interacted with each other or something, but you can tell it, can't you? Somebody may be doing the exact right um, motions of whatever thing they're about, uh, and that's not just in skating, but with anything, and you can tell if their heart is not in it. Or if you're in a job um, that doesn't reflect your heart, you know it. Uh, this idea of the heart uh, encapsulating or embodying everything that we are, um, we, we get that. I don't think we need to spend too much time on it. And related to that, if I say the, a person had a closed heart or a hardened heart, would be another way to say it, but Borg uses the term closed heart, you would know what I'm saying. Uh, in fact, Borg uh, talks about it like this in these kind of terms. That a closed heart uh, would indicate a person is not seeing clearly or fully, so it's going to affect their vision. Uh, that their thoughts are not aligned with God. Um, we see this in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But one of the things I think about with the Old Testament is Pharaoh and the uh, Exodus story uh, where he had a hardened heart. Uh, meaning he wasn't going to think about what Moses was saying or what God was trying to communicate. And part of his closed heart uh, was that his attitude was off. You see this in other characters uh, in the Bible as well. When their attitude is off, it's reflective of a closed heart. And naturally, if they're not seen clearly or fully, their thoughts are not aligned with God, their attitude is off, <laughs> you can bet your bottom dollar that their behavior is also off and is not reflective of God. So, a metaphorical heart, uh, Bohr goes on to say, um, a metaphorical closed heart affects us in ways that a literal hardened heart does, and it limits our life. Uh, I bet you've been at stages of your life where your heart has been closed. Sometimes it's through heartbreak, like in romantic relationships, and we're trucking along in this great relationship, and then the whole thing falls apart. And as soon as it falls apart, uh, we put up walls to protect ourselves. 
and then some amount of time passes and maybe the next person comes along that could be a good fit for us but if we're not in a good place we won't even give it the time of day because our hearts are hardened or maybe it's trust issues with friends that did us wrong and so our hearts are hardened or maybe we're full of pride we're we're arrogant about something we don't want to admit our mistakes whatever and our hearts get hardened and we know this from an objective um, point of view uh, looking at somebody else uh, we can see what it does <laughs> how it limits relationships how it limits a quality of life I mean good luck having a healthy marriage with a closed heart it's not gonna happen good luck feeling passionate involved in our world and feeling a connection with humanity with a closed heart it's not gonna happen you're, you're gonna be completely alone you're gonna feel perpetually alone as long as your heart is closed it's just the way it is it limits your life just like a hardened heart literally um, with different heart issues is going to limit your capacity uh, to live life to the full so a closed heart metaphorically is going to do the same thing so Borg just simply says that our goal as Christians and really God's hope for us for all kinds of reasons is that we will live with an open heart an open heart along these lines uh, of living in an open heart we get a quote from a guy that you may or may not be familiar with he's one of my heroes in the faith his name is Thomas Merton Thomas Merton was a mystic that lived um, oh, 40 50 years ago in that neck of the woods uh, I think he died in the early 70s late 60s early 70s just a brilliant guy he wrote about the true self had insights that were just incredible uh, was known the world over and revered uh, globally uh, for all faith traditions and within every sect of every faith I mean the guy was just off the charts brilliant and he said this he said life is this simple we are living in a world that is absolutely transparent and God is shining through it all the time this is not just a fable or a nice story it is true if we abandon ourselves to God and forget ourselves we see it sometimes and we see it maybe frequently God shows himself everywhere and everything in people and in things and in nature and in events it becomes very obvious that God is everywhere and in everything and we cannot be without him it's impossible the only thing is that we don't see it we don't see it so Marcus Borg continues this idea of well, what do we do about this not seeing a thing and so he says that the Christian life is about a new heart an open heart a heart of flesh a heart of compassion the Christian life is about the Spirit of God opening our hearts in thin places so this thin places idea is moments in our lives when uh, it seems like the Spirit is more able to break through and speak to us where we have insights that come seemingly from the very heart of God like sometimes it just jumps into our consciousness sometimes it's it almost feels like it's deafening it, it's so obvious to us and Borg is suggesting that there are ways that we can cultivate this you know one thing that I didn't mention which I it was just a miss on my part two weeks ago when we were talking about born again uh, Borg had this brilliant metaphor for our role in the born again process I mean born again is a thing that God does in us and through us it's God who gives us the new heart the new wind in our sails it's God's spirit that animates this whole thing however we do play a role and what Borg said in that chapter uh, fits with this one as well he said in short that spirituality is midwifery <laughs> spirituality is midwifery it's and what he's getting at there is is that we play a role in bringing about this born-again experience it's not all God we are in tandem with God and that is a completely biblical way to think about it uh, God isn't just up there you know pulling the strings on everything God is involved with us and God is looking for us to to join in the dance I mean that's <laughs> that's biblical that's good theology that's real life that's how it happens so what we do with our lives increases the odds of that born-again thing happening again and again and again 
and what we do with our lives, how we create our own spaces, also increases the likelihood of experiencing these thin places, these moments when God is able to break in. We can increase the amount and the number of our quote-unquote God moments or God sightings. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, so, uh, there are a range of things, and Borg goes into a handful of these uh, in his chapter. Uh, one thing he talks about, some of these are in the context of worship. Some don't require uh, a worship service at all, uh, especially in this day and age. I mean, back in the day, if you wanted to hear good music, you had to go to church. I mean, that's where it was, or the bar, uh, but no guarantee there. And probably the words aren't going to make you think in too many <laughs> biblical or divine ways. Uh, but in church, you would hear good music. And that's how it had been in our country even for a very long time until uh, fairly recently. Uh, and I mean really recently, uh, from record players to cassette tapes to CDs and now MP3s. Uh, now you can have an amazing worship experience with music in your car or on a walk with a decent set of headphones virtually anywhere. But the point is, is music has this capacity to do something in us. Uh, to, to cultivate something in us, to create an environment where we're able to hear differently. It moves us in ways that uh, are, are intangible, it seems. And, you know, sometimes for me, uh, the way uh, God sort of breaks into music, sometimes it's, sometimes it's songs uh, where the lyrics uh, combine with the music itself, and together uh, it's like a one-two punch, and they open me up. They don't even have to be Christian songs. Uh, sometimes, well, this wouldn't be a real surprise, but sometimes I resonate deeply with you two <laughs> and some of the things that uh, come out of those lyrics and the melody and the, how the whole thing works, and it opens me up. Sometimes it's definitely worship songs. Uh, some of the songs that we do here um, absolutely do that for me. Uh, some of the songs that we don't do here but do it for me are old songs that tap into older older or, or parts of my life from, from the past that were, were deeply touching, that maybe the music doesn't fit us anymore contextually, so we don't do them as much. Maybe sometimes we do, um, but those things do it. But you know, sometimes it, it's, it's just the orchestration itself, and I don't need lyrics at all. Uh, there's, a, there's one particular piece that's been used in, I don't know how many movies, but a bunch. It's Barber's Adagio. That's this incredibly building dramatic piece that if you pay attention to it and just sit through it I, I dare you to try to not be emotional you have to be as dense as can be to not let this thing move you I mean it is so powerful it just starts off so slow and sneaks up to you and, and crescendos into this climax which is so powerful and then it kind of falls off and leaves you and it's this it's this piece that's used for incredibly dramatic events, sometimes scenes of war and death and dying because that's how it is. And I just wonder, man, what was going on in that guy's life that he could be so in touch with this and put this together in orchestration? Music has that capacity to do it for us. It has that capacity to take us to great heights. It has the capacity to quiet us down and take us to incredible depths. And that leads us to worship, because worship and, and music sometimes go hand in hand. But worship is more than the music. Uh, some of you come to worship here at Crosswalk, and you honestly don't give a rip about the music. <laughs> sometimes for you guys, it's, it's uh, you want to hear the teaching. Uh, and that's, that's awesome. That's great. That's what's doing it for you. Fine. For some of you, uh, music's really not your thing. The teaching, you can, you know, take or leave. <laughs> uh, but the thing for you is seeing people. And you feel connected to this community. And it's like when you come to worship on Sunday, you remember you're in this thing, not alone, but with other people who are getting the same message and, and going toward the same goals. So, so worship has this interesting, multi-layered uh, thing for us. And not just worship, but uh, study. For some of you, that's why the teaching does it for you, because I'm bringing to you information that you're probably not going to get otherwise. You're not going to take the time to listen to a podcast or read a book. And so I'm your, I'm your input for that, which, you know, that's why I try to work pretty hard to give you something worth inputting. 
How about some for you? Uh, for some of you, it is the podcast. Uh, it'd be way beyond me. You're you're getting fed by who knows how many other incredible teachers that are out there through podcasts, through videos, through TED talks, through uh, good deep uh, reading on great topics. That's great. And sometimes God breaks in in those moments and shapes you and speaks to you in powerful ways. Uh, sometimes uh, I hear this a lot, especially people who don't go to church, don't like church, don't want to go to church. And they'll tell me that their worship sanctuary is nature. You get them on a trail somewhere and uh, they feel connected uh, to the greater other, uh, be that God or whatever. Uh, sometimes it's an ocean. Sometimes it's a mountaintop. Sometimes it's redwoods. I mean, we have it all right here, which is awesome. Uh, that's such a gift. Uh, but, you know, you can, you can also have similar experiences in the Great Plains. Uh, you can have a, a similar experience on a pond like Walden. <laughs> uh, it doesn't take much. I don't know if you remember this. A couple of years ago, I did a, a na well, it wasn't a nature walk. It was just a walk. I took you on a walk for one of my sermons. And I took my phone with me uh, to take pictures of stuff that I thought was extraordinary. I couldn't get 10 feet without a new extraordinary. This kind of gets back to what Merton was saying, that it is all around us, uh, the beauty of nature, and knowing that the creation itself uh, gives evidence of the one who created it. Uh, it's majestic. You can't miss it. So for some of you, you know exactly what I'm saying. Uh, you take a slow walk in nature, you're connected. But there's one thing that I want to talk to you about today that I think everybody, every one of us needs to work on. And I would suggest that in one way or another, all of these other things help facilitate this one thing uh, that I think if we can get our brains around and cultivate, foster, midwife into our, our world, we're going to experience a lot more thin places. And we're going to experience a lot more of this born again, 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 again thing. And not only are our, li our lives going to change, uh, but I think our capacity to walk with God in very powerful ways in this world and make change in this world are going to radically increase. And as soon as I say this, you're going to be like, I don't want to hear this. I'm terrible. I hate this, what you're saying right now. And I'm totally cool with that. So let me just take a drink of coffee. You do too. The thing I want to talk to you about is silence. 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 Most of us are uncomfortable with silence. You, you go to a restaurant, you see a couple <laughs> sitting at a table and they're absolutely silent. You know, first thought I have is, dude, what did you do? <laughs> because usually it's the dude uh, that does something wrong and all of a sudden there's gonna be a silent dinner conversation, right? No conversation. Silence sometimes is unnerving. And so what have we done in our culture more now than ever? We've allowed noise to come in. We are noisier now than we have ever been uh, in our human existence. And our beautiful little technology pieces we carry around in our pockets and purses uh, only increase that noise. I'm talking about uh, auditory noise uh, that's around us with the sound of urban whatever from cars and construction and planes and all that. And I'm talking about visual noise. It is going on all of the time. We can't, we can't go very long without some kind of an interruption uh, breaking in. Noise. And I'm wondering, how do you do with silence? How do you do with quiet? Because biblically, quiet is where it's at. I would go another step and suggest to you uh, that the way of Christ whispers. And if we're not quiet enough to hear it or see it, we're going to miss it. And I would go further. To piggyback on Thomas Merton, I would say the way of quiet, <laughs> the way of Christ, <laughs> the way of Christ whispers incessantly. And we just don't have the ears to hear it. This is deeply biblical, my friends. You go in the first book of the Bible and you've got, uh, you've got the creation story. The first one in Genesis 1 is a poem. And the whole thing starts off with nothing. Absolute silence. And every piece of creation, 
God speaks into reality. The oldest book uh, in the Bible, the oldest story in the Bible, that's the oldest book as well, is the, the work of Job, the story of Job. And in this story, it's, it's an interesting, it's a fascinating story, it's a brilliant story about our life and how we process pain and struggle and all that. It's brilliant. Um, so this poor guy, Job, has his world turned upside down in an apparent contest between God and Satan. And for most of the chapters of the book, after the contest starts, it's noisy. Uh, Job is constantly hearing from his friends telling him, well, he must have done something wrong. And after they get done saying he hasn't done anything wrong, um, at each turn, Job retorts, and there's more noise. But now it's coming from Job, and Job's the one making the noise. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't, I didn't deserve this. I don't know what's going on. I'm not going to deny God, but, but this is unjust. I didn't do this. I haven't done anything so bad as to deserve all of my kids uh, dying and uh, losing all of my possessions and all this stuff. Uh, it wasn't until he was silent, until he shut up and turned the noise off, including his own noise, that he was able to hear God respond. Uh, you go into uh, uh, some of the other stories in the Old Testament. Abraham hears God undoubtedly in silence. Um, Joseph, uh, famous for his, his uh, interpretation of dreams. Well, a dream. <laughs> silence. You're finally able to listen. Samuel, first prophet in ancient Israel, uh, hears the whisper of God in quiet and doesn't even know it's God yet. Uh, you go into Isaiah. Uh, he experiences uh, God in a vision. The prophets, I mean, multiple prophets experience visions of God, meaning that's the only thing they're able to hear. You go into the New Testament story. How does the New Testament story start? You have Mary getting a vision. Before that, you have um, um, Elizabeth's uh, dude, uh, Zachariah, <laughs> uh, silence inside the temple, and he gets this vision, this announcement from God. Joseph, before he divorces Mary, uh, is visited by a messenger from God and a dream where he's silent. Jesus, as soon as he signs up for this thing and he begins his earthly ministry, what does he do? He goes off alone for 40 days of silence and reflection. Uh, silence is a key piece. Uh, you go to other major, major characters in the New Testament. You have Peter the Apostle. Uh, when he has his grand vision of including Gentiles into this whole big venture of Christianity. He's on a rooftop meditating in silence where he gets this vision from God. He's quiet. And Peter loved to talk. He was usually putting his foot in his mouth. But for this period of time, he was silent. Now sometimes we're not paying any attention at all. And our hearts are closed and we go forward and it's a big fat mess. And Paul, the apostle, was an example of this. So Paul the Apostle uh, was trucking along, trying to round up Christians, trying to stop this whole thing. As closed as of heart as you can imagine. And literally he gets stopped in his tracks by Christ. Uh, and he was silent finally. And after that first moment of silence, he was silent for a, an extended period of time. So he could understand and listen to the Spirit of God about how he'd screwed it all up. Silence is gold, and silence is key to allow for thin places to happen, for God to speak to you, because the way of Christ whispers incessantly. You may hate silence. You may not want to do it. You may suck at it. I get it. And the reason why you suck at it is because you're not very practiced at it. You think these Olympic athletes that you admire so much just woke up one day and now all of a sudden they're able to do all this crazy stuff on a half pipe or they're able to dance like they do or do these flips and turns and whatever else uh, on the ice. You think, you think Lindsey Vaughn uh, just, you know, became 13 one day and then decided, hey, I think I can tackle this mountain at incredible speeds. Uh, do you think the bobsled guys and the skeleton guys uh, just decided, hey, let's just try this. <laughs> Why not? Let's just put our lives at risk. You think, you think they're going to go down at 80 miles an hour and still live uh, all at once? No way, man. Uh, we know this. Uh, the people that we look at as the experts in their field, 
Uh, it took time to develop these things, and silence is just like that. So the good news for you is there are tools to help you develop silence, which is going to help you open your eyes to the thin places so that you are able to see God at work and on display all around you all of the time, and it will change your life. It'll change your perspective. You won't have to meditate for three hours to finally get inner peace because you can walk in it all of the time. It's going to change the way you look at people. It's going to change what comes out of your mouth. It's going to change what you do with your hands because that's what an open heart does. You see differently. You think differently. You feel differently. You have a different attitude about everything. And all these things combine and coalesce together so that you behave differently. That's the goal. Thin places allow God to break in and teach us in those ways. And you're invited into those, and you can cultivate those. And there are apps for that. <laughs> so go find a meditation app that will teach you how to be silent. It will drive you nuts at first. But if you can master the art of silence, you can start to turn off the voices in your head and start to turn on your ears for the Spirit of God and allow God to speak to you incessantly. God's always speaking, but are we listening? Uh, Borg ends this chapter with just a great quote uh, from former General Secretary Dag Hammarskjöld. Um, he died tragically in a plane crash in the 60s. He was the youngest uh, General Secretary of the United Nations and he was a mystic Christian. And in one of his journals uh, that he was keeping while on a trip to uh, the Congo, uh, he wrote these words, which is just a beautiful way uh, for us to think about how we live our lives. And it's my benediction and prayer for you uh, going forward from today. Dag Hammarskjöld uh, said this, wrote this as a prayer to God. Give us pure hearts that we may see you humble hearts that we may hear you, hearts of love that we may serve you, hearts of faith that we may abide in you. Would you say this out loud one more time with me as a way to end this teaching? Give us pure hearts that we may see you, humble hearts that we may hear you, hearts of love that we may serve you, hearts of faith that we may abide in you. My friends, I hope you have a great week. I hope you start to wake up, literally wake up to the reality that God is everywhere all the time. There is no separation. Uh, God is constantly whispering, constantly speaking through creation and directly to us. I pray that you have the eyes, the head, the heart, and the hands to experience it. We'll see you next week. Hope you have a good one. And uh, can't wait to get on this thing with you again. See you then. Bye.